Hey everybody, welcome back. Okay, today I want to talk about psychedelics. And first, I want to make it clear that I spent years of my life fascinated by talking about and taking psychedelics. I thought that their potential was immense, and I used to regard it as one of the most important experiences of my life. So this is not a detached, judgmental thing. I'm intimately familiar with the arguments in favor of them, and I completely understand their draw. I just want to go into detail as to why I've reversed my opinion on that. And the first point I want to get into is really important because this person had a huge influence on my life, especially in the area of psychedelics. And he continues to have a large impact on millions of people, and that is Terrence McKenna. So Terrence McKenna was an intellectual who articulated the psychedelic experience better than anyone in history, in my opinion. He played a huge role in influencing me to take certain doses and types of psychedelics. Although he had been encouraging people to take large doses of psychedelics, his wife Kathleen Harrison and his brother Dennis McKenna revealed that he had long since stopped taking those doses himself. I got this information from Joe Schimmel at Good Fight Ministries, which I highly recommend his work. He's amazing. But Terrence's brother, Dennis McKenna, wrote in his book, The Brotherhood of the Screaming Abyss. Terrence was well ensconced in his iconic role as the chief spokesman for the new psychedelic culture. He was out there on the public stage, and there were growing legions of fans who loved to hear his rap. A strong cognitive dissonance emerged between his public persona as the shaman guru and his own self-understanding that he was anything but an enlightened being. It happened when they were living for a time on the big island, and it was a mushroom trip they shared that was absolutely terrifying for Terrence. It was terrifying because, for some reason, the mushroom turned on him. The gentle, wise, humorous mushroom spirit that he had come to know and trust as an ally and teacher ripped back the facade to reveal an abyss of utter existential despair. This induced panic in Terrence and probably, I speculate, a feeling that he was going mad. He couldn't deal with it. Kat's efforts to reassure him were fruitless. After that experience, he never again took mushrooms and he took other psychedelics such as DMT and ayahuasca only on rare occasions and with great reluctance. The trickster mushroom had betrayed him. He could no longer take them and the prospect of what they might present to him was too terrifying. Yet there he was in the public position of being the new Timothy Leary, the explorer psychonaut who was supposedly plunging down the rabbit hole every weekend. His fans did not know this, but Terrence knew it, and he knew that his public representation was disingenuous. Terrence became so good at doing his shtick that it really didn't matter whether it made sense or not. It sounded great. It was what people wanted to hear, and it paid the bills, and it became the trap from which he could not escape. The problem with this is that he didn't really believe much anymore in the shtick or the concepts he purported to represent. He couldn't or wouldn't take psychedelics again to get recharged. As a result, he became disillusioned with himself and with his fans. He could no longer be honest with either himself or his fans, and this led to a further cognitive dissonance. He began to feel even more like a fraud than ever. He became quite depressed. He became trapped in his own public persona like a caged performer on stage and in response gradually lost respect for his fans. So one of his main taglines was that if you haven't taken five grams of dried mushrooms in silent darkness by yourself, you don't even know what the psychedelic experience is like. First of all, you take a committed dose. You don't take some namby-pamby, piddling, testing it out, toe in the water kind of dose. Because, you know, even in the Christian, in the gospel, Christ says, it's the lukewarm that I vomit out of my mouth. You know, <laughs> don't bring me any dilettantes, no dabblers, no drugstore cowboys. So you take a committed dose. What is a committed dose? A dose that when you think about taking it, you feel fear. That's a committed <laughs> dose. People do not take enough mushrooms. They take pissant amounts and then they claim that they're initiates. You must take a measured five dried grams on an empty stomach. And this is at a time when I was absolutely fascinated by the experience and was interested in exploring the potential to the fullest extent. So I took him at his word and this experience, for better or worse, basically changed the course of my life. And so the fact that while he was purporting these things as the spokesman on a soapbox preaching this stuff, he wasn't even doing it himself because he had a terrifying demonic experience is absolutely incredible. 
And I just feel like I want to shout this from the rooftops because, again, so many people are being influenced by this person still because of his online, you know, he died in 1999, but his influence is just is still massive because of the videos on YouTube. And he's so interesting to listen to. And he's a wordsmith. And, you know, he's so, so sarcastic. And, and like, it makes you he really makes you believe that he knows what he's talking about. And the fact that he wasn't even taking them is just is again, it's just like, it's ridiculous. All of this fancy, clever wording that he was using is just all empty. So Albert Hoffman, who first synthesized LSD, I always hear about this beautiful bike ride he took the first time he synthesized LSD coming back from the lab to his house. Um, but this is his description of his first LSD experience in his autobiography, LSD, My Problem Child. A demon had invaded me, had taken possession of my mind, body, and soul. I jumped up and screamed, trying to free myself from him, but then sank down again and lay helpless on the sofa. He went on to say, Most research reports cite, in spite of all other diversity among LSD experimentation, the feeling of an alien being, a demon seizing possession of oneself are features of LSD inebriation. So I know a lot of people don't experience that, but the way that I see it now is basically like you get comfortable with the deception, like the 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 deception has to offer you something. It has to come in the form of a friend offering you candy. It's like with Terrence McKenna, it's like it it has to hide. It can't it can't show up like a monster, right? At first, at least, or, you know, um, and so in order for any deception to work, there has to be some draw, some allure and an offer an offering something to entice you. And as I covered in the last episode, Timothy Leary, um, who was leading the charge of the psychedelic movement in the 1960s, felt that he was carrying on the work of Satanist Aleister Crowley. Well, I've been an admirer of Aleister Crowley. I think that uh, I'm carrying on much of the work that uh, he started uh, over 100 years ago. So I covered a lot of Aleister Crowley in the last episode. He was involved in human sacrifices and all that. But on this topic, he said, I am the snake that giveth knowledge and delight and bright glory and stir the hearts of men with drunkenness. To worship me, take wine and strange drugs. They shall not harm ye at all. It is a lie, this folly against self. Be strong, O man, lust. Enjoy all things of sense. Fear not that any god shall deny thee for this. If that doesn't sound like the voice of Satan himself, I don't know what does. But he was addicted to heroin and cocaine. And so this freedom he talks about is a lie. It's like the Bob Dylan song says, it may be the devil or it may be the Lord, but you're going to have to serve somebody. You're always going to be in bondage to something. Um, it's just a matter of which one you choose to be in bondage to, God or sin. So, you know, take a look at some of the heroes of the movement. We've got Terrence McKenna, who was a fraud and didn't even want to trip because he had a demonic experience. We have Albert Hoffman, the inventor of LSD, felt like he was possessed the first time he took it. And Timothy Leary felt like he was carrying on the work of a Satanist who murdered children. So this is Aldous Huxley talking to Timothy Leary. Your role is quite simple. Become a cheerleader for evolution. These brain drugs will bring about vast changes in society. We must spread the word. The obstacle to this evolution, Timothy, is the Bible. So let's see what the Bible says about this. In Galatians 5, 19 through 21, it says, Those who practice witchcraft will not inherit the kingdom of God. So the word witchcraft here is translated from the Greek word pharmakia. Pharmakia is where we get words like pharmacy and pharmaceuticals. Um, that doesn't mean that all pharmaceuticals are bad. It just means that if you're trying to achieve enlightenment using a shortcut or a substance, that's what it would refer to as sorcery. Um, the Bible is clear about surrendering only to God and not surrendering to a substance. Um, it says be sober minded 170 times in the Bible. It's one of the most commanded things. So the, fa the family of Greek words related to pharmakia, like pharmacon, pharmakos, pharmakous, are used in the Bible in reference to mind-expanding drugs and the world of the occult in contact with fallen angelic beings. So they are translated magic, witchcraft, druggings, dope peddlings, etc. Here's another quote from Aleister Crowley. Things like heroin and alcohol may be and should be used for the purpose of worshiping, that is, entering into communion with the snake that giveth knowledge and delight and bright glory. Jim Morrison of The Doors also talked about riding the snake constantly um, while he was on acid. And Raymond Zarek, keyboardist for The Doors, said, 
We had been ingesting a lot of psychedelic chemicals, so the doors of perception were cleansed in our minds, and we saw the music as a vehicle to, in a sense, become proselytizers of a new religion, a religion of self, of each man as God. That was the original idea behind the doors. So that's the oldest lie in the book, um, literally, <laughs> the oldest lie in the book. It, Satan comes to Eve in the garden and says, you can be like God. It's the ultimate pride. And this is a quote from my mom. Don't smoke weed. It could be laced with THC. So just something to keep in mind. I also want to say that I'm not against research for psychedelics, for things like PTSD in a clinical setting. It's totally fine. Um, but I think that's such a small percentage of our culture, which by and large is seeking enlightenment through psychedelics. And like Raymond Zarek said, a new religion and so that's mostly what I'm speaking to. This is not the way to find the true God. And one more thing I want to cover is this concept that psychedelics are just revealing you to yourself. If you're in new age circles or pro psychedelic circles, you'll hear this all the time that everything that happens, if you have a bad trip or anything that happens at all is just a projection of your subconscious mind. This is a lie that kept me going for a long time. And I think that the perfect example is Terrence McKenna. This guy was so intelligent. He was so experienced, apparently, on psychedelics. And he would smoke DMT at the height of acid trips to prolong the DMT experience. So this is not a guy who needed to do more shadow work. You know, like what happened to him was not shadow work. Um, this was a being that tricked him and came in the form of a friend and got him to trust him and then revealed its malevolent being to him. And there are beings that exist outside of yourself. There are angels and demons and God that would exist without you. I'll leave you with a Terrence McKenna impression. I mean, this is reminiscent of the sadomasochist movement of the 18th century. I mean, this... <laughs> My message is here that God is found through prayer, reading his word, fasting, humbling yourself. You draw near to him, he'll draw near to you through those means. Um, it's not through taking psychedelics and calling yourself God and being prideful in that way. Thanks so much for listening. God bless you. Peace.